Hello, and welcome to our first lecture. I'm Deb Sahadi, your teaching director. I hope your core groups went well. You might have experienced some minor technical difficulties. If so, be patient. I think we'll get these things worked out sooner rather than later. So with that, we're just gonna jump right in. Do you like big trees? Yeah, I do. I thought this was a good picture to introduce our study for the year because it reminds me of strength and power and life, like the four gospels of the New Testament, strength and power and life. Ever wonder why there are four gospels, why one isn't enough, or why there aren't two or three or five? We know the Bible is the inerrant word of God, so it should not surprise us that God's perfect design of his word, not only the writing itself, but the whole contents and the structure is perfect. Now we know that each gospel was written by a different author and each one was aimed at a particular audience. Every gospel bears the author's name and we find literally all mankind is specifically addressed. Matthew was written to the Jews, Mark to the Romans, Luke to the Greeks, and John to all of mankind. And if we trace through Isaiah's writings about the promised Messiah, we find that four primary characteristics of our Messiah are ascribed. He would be a king, a servant, son of man, and son of God. And it's these attributes that are highlighted in each of the four Gospels. And taken together, we're provided with a complete picture of Jesus. Matthew portrays Jesus as king. Mark shows us Jesus the servant. Luke brings out the son of man. And John, the son of God. And each gospel exposes these aspects of Jesus in a different way. Matthew deploys a synthetic approach featuring discourses. Mark is chronological and highlights miracles. Luke is primarily historic and uses parables. And John is theologic, incorporating personal interviews. Independently, the gospels are amazingly strong, powerful, and life-giving. And taken together, all strength and power and life are both harnessed and unleashed at the same time, sort of like a magnificent symphony with each section woven into a harmonious whole. So before we go on, let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we can come together and study your mighty word. And Father God, we just pray that you will open our eyes and our ears and our hearts so that each one of us will learn exactly what you're trying to teach each one of us individually. Father God, we're so thankful for this ministry. We're thankful for the technology so that we can come together in these unusual times. And we just pray that our hearts are truly opened to what you will teach us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as you know, this year we will be focusing on one of the four Gospels, and that is the good news, the Gospel according to John. Now, our text this year has far fewer pages than last year's reading of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, but it's certainly no less powerful. And we'll probably appreciate the more concise writing and the shorter passages. I mean, it did get pretty complicated last year, right? I mean, there were so many rules, statutes, commands, and just when we thought we had it figured out, more rules. And these were the easy ones. Remember going through all those passages, especially in Leviticus? At times it was very confusing, yes, like this sign, for example. And let me read it. No person shall on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, the day preceding, notice the misspelling, a public holiday or on a public holiday drive or cause to be driven between the hours of 6 p.m. and midnight, notice the misplaced punctuation, a motor vehicle which exceeds 10.5 meters in length in all main roads. What? Well, in the end, it all came down to one very simple principle. There's God's way and everything else. And notice that God's way is the way to exit. Exit what? A life of rebellion, sin, death, which is separation from God. So what is God's way? When we're lost, and we were all lost, how do we get back to God? John 14, 6 plainly tells us, 
Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this is the core doctrine. This is the fundamental truth that gives us eternal life in a restored relationship with God the Father. It's through Jesus Christ's sacrificial crucifixion and death, his resurrection and ascension, that the way is made possible by faith through God's generous grace. It is Jesus' crucifixion, death, resurrection, and ascension that is the good news, the gospel. And this year, we'll be traveling with Jesus in his earthly ministry through one of his disciples and close companion, John. The book of John is the fourth book of the New Testament. So we bridge from Moses to John roughly 1,500 years. And we bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament with a gap of 400 years, the same amount of time the Israelites were held in Egyptian captivity. Just as God had prepared Israel during those 400 years, God was busy preparing the world for his son's arrival. Malachi was the last prophet of the Old Testament through whom God spoke, and then silence for 400 years. Well, where was God and what was he doing? Well, after Malachi, he was busy bringing the world to a point of readiness. In our study of the Israelites in Babylonian captivity a couple of years ago, we saw how Cyrus, king of Persia, had released the Jews from captivity in 536 BC, allowing them to return and restore their homes, the temple, and their national worship. Alexander the Great ended Persian domination of Israel in 333 BC, and with it, he extended the Greek Empire and new roads, including its culture, its philosophy, and its language throughout most of the known world. Long after the Greek Empire had fallen, Greek was still the common language throughout the Mediterranean world. The result was that in the first century AD, the truth of Jesus, the Messiah, was written in a literary form called Gospels in the Greek language, a language that was easily understood by many nations. Isn't God's plan timing and orchestration absolutely brilliant? But wait, there's more. Beginning in 167 BC, Israel enjoyed more than a century of self-rule after a successful revolt against Greece. During this time, they developed their system of synagogues where the faithful gathered each Sabbath to hear the scriptures taught and where young boys from devout Jewish families were provided formal education. The Pharisees were the theological conservative leaders of the synagogues. On the other end of the religious spectrum, the Sadducees were more politically connected leaders of the temple system in Jerusalem. In 63 BC, the Roman general Pompey and his armies conquered Jerusalem. Israel was allowed to continue their religious practices, but they paid dearly in taxes and a loss of national freedom. The next few decades were fearful and uncertain for the Jewish people. Herod the Great was appointed ruler of Judea, the province containing Jerusalem, in 40 BC. During Herod's rule, he embellished and expanded the temple to a considerable degree. He also became increasingly perverted and paranoid. In fits of jealous rage, he killed his wife, two sons, and several other family members that he perceived as threats to his throne. Now this is the same Herod who was so upset at hearing the Magi's report of a newborn king that he ordered the massacre of male children in search for Jesus. Herod the Great died, and it was his son, Herod, who stood before uh, who Jesus stood before on trial, and you can read about that in Luke 26, sorry, 23. Ruled by numerous pagan warring nations over the years, most recently Rome, Israel for the most part had lost track of its king and kingdom. Pagan political leaders ruled, false religious leaders held power, Greek philosophy was treated like a religion, and the people were languishing in disarray especially spiritual disarray, like sheep without a shepherd. Kind of like today, right? But God was, in fact, working. He was setting the stage for the next phase of his plan, the coming of his son. 
with the passing of those four centuries, Galatians 4, 4 to 5 tells us, quote, the time had fully come. God sent his son, born of a woman, to redeem those under law, end quote. The fullness of time had come. The Greeks had spread their language far and wide. The Romans had built their unifying roads, hugely expanding the Greek network of roads, and the priesthood among the Jews had hit an all-time low. The fullness of time had come, and the world was about to hear from God like never before. Christ Jesus, Son of God, would pierce the darkness. He would pierce it with the truth of light, replacing false philosophy with the light of life replacing oppression and with the light of the way replacing legalism john and eyewitness would document the major events of jesus's earthly ministry why he tells us in john 20 verse 31 he says but these things are written so that you may believe that jesus is the christ the son of god and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of John is in like, unlike any other of the three synoptic Gospels, which share a somewhat common chronology of many of the same events of Jesus's life. Only John, on the other hand, speaks of the Logos, the Word, who was with the Father in the beginning, who came down from heaven, incarnate in the person of Jesus. In fact, this is how John opens the gospel. Matthew and Luke begin their accounts with documenting Jesus's lineage and birth, and Mark begins with the ministry of John the Baptist. In John, we find Jesus's message is presented primarily in terms of eternal life and resurrection, in contrast to the other gospels which highlight the kingdom of God. And we find John's writing to present Jesus' teachings through long conversations or speeches and debates. The other Gospels often portray Jesus' teachings in parables and sayings. In the Gospel of John, we find extensive teaching about the Holy Spirit, which is actually scarce in the other Gospels, which also include Jesus' baptism, his temptations, his exorcisms, his transfiguration, and his institution of the Lord's Supper, which are all absent in John's account. And while there are differences in John's documentation of the good news of Jesus Christ, there are many items that are the same among all four Gospels. For example, the witness of John the Baptist, the call and instruction of the disciples, the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, Jesus' voyage with his disciples on the Sea of Galilee, Peter's confession of faith, Jesus' triumphal entry to Jerusalem, Jesus' remarkable claims and his miraculous acts of power, the developing opposition and hostility of the Jewish religious leaders, the cleansing of the temple, Jesus' final meal with his disciples, his arrest in Gethsemane, his trial, condemnation, and crucifixion, his resurrection on the third day, Jesus' resurrection appearance, and his commissioning his disciples in addition to many sayings of Jesus. And note that this is not an inconsiderable list. John is perhaps the most explicitly theological of the four Gospels, and at its heart is the deity of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And John's Gospel is probably the clearest witness to this in the New Testament with no less than 61 references and proof points attesting to Jesus Christ's deity. Fully man, yet fully God. We gaze upon the glory of God, the everlasting Son made flesh, and reflect that glory in our everyday lives. And John's gospel in God's word helps us do just that. And you know, the mystery of Jesus is always beyond us, right? I mean, it's beyond us, but it continues to beckon us to explore it more fully. I'm sure our study this year will answer many mysteries while it opens additional ones. We'll get to know Jesus better, but at the same time, we'll come to realize how far beyond our grasp he really is. I heard it once said that a Christ who is fully comprehended is not divine at all. 
So the question is, will we choose to believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Will we choose to believe in God's Word, the Word that became flesh, the Word that was with God in the beginning, the Word that was God? When the Jewish crowd asked Jesus what work God requires them to do, he answered. He said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. He said this in John 6, 29. Obedience to this command reaps the highest blessing, restoration and peace with God. Will we believe in God's son, believe that he has a plan with perfect timing, no matter how chaotic the world becomes, God is sovereign and he is in control. When Satan means to deceive, distract, disarm, and destroy, God will use it all for good, for his purposes, for his glory. And this from John 1.14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just look with eager anticipation to jumping into the gospel according to John, to walking with Jesus, and we're just so thankful to you for giving us your word, both written and in the person of Jesus. And Father God, we pray that in the coming weeks we will just develop such a hunger for your word, and that we will Stick with our study, even though there may be distractions and technical difficulties along the way. But we just pray that you will take center stage, that our focus will be on you, and that we will learn from your Holy Spirit, we'll learn from each other, and together we will all grow in your grace. Father God, we love you. We thank you so much. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. So now, for next week... What you need to do is read lesson one commentary and then complete lesson two questions. You're not going to read the lesson two commentary. You're going to wait until after next week's lesson. And as always, go to church when believe in God's word, the word that was made flesh in Jesus Christ. Walk with Jesus through the book of John and be prepared to be transformed. Thanks everybody, looking forward to next week. God bless you.